So the question is, how should you be routing your guitar tracks when looking to compress your heavy guitar tracks? And also, how do you deal with automation when you have a plethora of vocal tracks to mix? Welcome to Viewer Questions Answered, episode 27. Now I know I'm coming at you from a different location and it's because there are certain parts of my house that are currently infected. So I have to stay up here for now and film in my lovely purple living room. So without any further ado, let's get to this excellent group of questions submitted by my loyal subscribers. Okay, and our first question here comes from Christopher. You spoke about a dB or so of volume automation on a dense chorus with multiple instruments. My question, how would you approach a dense chorus mix of vocals? Main chorus lines with an additional line that is different from those words and backing woes plus growls and screams sprinkled in. Thanks as always. Well, Christopher, this is an excellent question. And the first thing I gotta say is you wanna make sure that your arrangement is right in the first place. Uh, so many times people send me things to mix and there are so many extra tracks that just aren't necessary in the production and often are conflicting with the main focus of the production. Uh, in other words, the main vocal line or the main chorus line or vocal line that the listener should be paying attention to. Now let's just assume that everything is correct as far as production and arrangement and you're just having issues trying to fit all of your vocal tracks into the mix with everything going on at once. Uh, a philosophy that I like to follow is very simple. I make sure that there's one prime element of the mix that the listener should be focusing on and everything else is secondary. Now the main issue with this is let's say you have a main chorus line and then all of a sudden a harmony kicks in and then the main chorus line is still going and all of a sudden you have uh, growls kicking in that double the main chorus line. It's gonna sound like you have your chorus line that gets big all of a sudden, then gets smaller and quiet, then big all of a sudden. And the way I combat this is very simple. I draw in simple automation to just reduce the volume of the main line when extra elements are sprinkled in. And then I return the volume of the main vocal line back to its normal volume so that Way, it always sounds consistent volume wise and it doesn't sound like things are dropping in or all of a sudden getting loud out of nowhere. It seems like it can be complicated, but it's very, very simple. It's all a matter of just using volume automation to make sure that the perceived volume is consistent when these elements drop in or out. And I follow the same approach when mixing pretty much any other background element, whether it's guitars, keyboards, or special effects. So Christopher, hopefully this answers your question and let me know how that works out for you. Okay, question number two comes from Flo and it is a good one. Nice tips, Bobby. I wonder what's your take on mixing snare with lots of ghost notes? As a drummer who spends lots of time practicing, I feel sad when the mixer just gates the snare and eliminates the ghost notes. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Okay, well Flo, it is very, very challenging when you're dealing with ghost notes and when you're using a live snare track in your mix. So in other words, let's say the majority of the song has regular snare hits that you gate out uh, to get rid of cymbal bleed, and all of a sudden the drummer, you in this example, you're playing nice light ghost notes, they're gonna be cut out by the gate. So generally what I do is I create a second snare track uh, within my DAW and I cut out the audio that contains the ghost notes and I just eliminate the gate altogether or I maybe use a different setting with a much lower threshold. It's very simple at the end of the day. It's either gonna take a separate treatment altogether like I just mentioned, or you can even automate your gate on the main snare track. But at the end of the day, it's the exact same process. The idea is that you wanna change the gate settings for those ghost notes. Again, whether it's just copying that specific audio to a different track and eliminating the gate, or using a gate with different settings, or just automating the gate on your main snare track. There is no magic bullet, there is no one magical setting that's gonna miraculously uh, get rid of all the cymbal bleed on the harder hits and then all of a sudden just open up on the ghost notes. You have to go in there and automate stuff or treat it on a separate track. Hopefully that answers your question and uh, hopefully that works out for you. Okay, we have another good question and this one comes from Wallace and it has to do with drum recording. Late to the party on this, Bobby, but your recent drum setup video landed me here. I'm trying out your close mic approach you take to cymbals and I'm looking for some advice when mixing. Are you gating slash automating slash limiting the individual cymbal mics when they are not being hit? Example, if the drummer hits the left crash and the right crash and the left left crash, are you ducking the cymbals that are not being hit at the exact same moment? I notice in your DAW you have the hi-hat track completely removed until the drummer starts hitting it. 
Thanks a lot. Well, Wallace, this is an excellent question and I'll share with you my approach. I do not do any complex gating or writing of the symbols unless it's a creative decision within the mix. I wanna make sure the source sounds right and can stand on its own in the first place when tracking the actual drums. So in other words, with my crash cymbals, I leave them open the entire time in my mix. I don't do any ducking or volume automation for any reason. Uh, the only time I will remove tracks, and I noticed you had a sharp eye and you noticed it in my mix, is I will completely generally remove the hi-hat track when the drummer isn't playing the hi-hat. I also do this with the ride cymbal, and I'll often do this with a china cymbal as well, especially if a drummer has a boatload of cymbals on the kit that he only hits here or there. And also splashes I do this a lot with too, where I'll cut out all the audio on the splash track so that way it's nice and present in the mix and the splash comes through nice and clear, but it's not getting jumbled up with the rest of the drum sound when he's not playing the splash because more than likely the sound coming through that splash mic is probably not ideal for the sound of my overheads. And as far as limiting and compression, I prefer to barely compress my cymbals because we all know hi-hats can be the biggest pain in the neck when you're mixing your drum tracks and hi-hats are often so loud no matter what you do they're gonna end up bleeding into every single microphone and they're often very, very loud in your overheads, which is why I prefer to close mic my crashes in the first place. So because of this, I don't over compress any of my cymbal mics because in general, over compressing my cymbals bring up my hi-hat, which I don't want. And also over compressing cymbals will bring up the shells and the snare drum. And for me, I like to get the overall glue of my kit from my room mics, not from my overheads. Unless I'm doing something like indie rock or country from metal and hard rock and just overall extreme music, I prefer to close mic my cymbals and just get cymbals coming through the cymbal mics. So Wallace, excellent question. Let me know if you have any additional questions on this topic. Okay, and our final question here comes from Mike. I work using Reaper as my DAW. What I've been doing is sending my guitars to another track to add compression and whatnot. I forever thought this was bussing same goes for a mix bus. Now I've learned about folders. What is the correct way to utilize bus or parallel compression or even effects? I'm trying to go that extra mile and make my mixes sound as transparent as possible. Thanks again for everything, Mike. Okay, well, Mike, this is an excellent question. Um, and the truth is Reaper has a very unique way of how it deals with routing in a way. In other words, in Reaper, you don't have buses in Reaper. Uh, in a program like Pro Tools, which I use, and Logic and even Cubase, you can have these things called internal buses, which are pretty much just internal pathways in your DAW. In Reaper, you could send anything anywhere, which for me is sort of like a blessing and a curse in a way, it makes things simpler, but in another way, it could kind of make things complicated. At the end of the day, all of this is exactly the same. You could achieve all of these different routing configurations within any DAW, it's just the wording and the way you go about doing it. So for example, let's say you have a pair of rhythm guitars that you want to compress and you're in Reaper. You could group your guitars and bust them in pretty much one of two ways. You could send your two rhythm guitars to a new stereo track and then remove your guitars from the main master bus. In a sense here, you're creating a submix for your rhythm guitars and then you could compress the track that your guitars are being sent to. In other words, you're compressing your guitars submix. The other thing you could do, which you mentioned, is you could take those two guitars and put them within a folder track, which automatically acts like a submix for the two tracks that you put in. So in other words, a folder track is sort of like a submix. Actually, it is a submix. And in this situation, you could simply add that compression to your folder track, and then you're compressing anything that's being sent through it in this case, your two rhythm guitars. Now there's an important distinction here that I wanna clarify. Let's say you wanna use parallel compression on your rhythm guitars. I don't generally do this, but people do it, and it would be the same for drums or anything else. In this case, you would wanna use a send, like I mentioned in the first situation, to a new track, but you'd also wanna keep your two tracks that you're sending going to the master fader as well. So this way you have pretty much two copies of your guitar tracks. The dry guitar is going to your master fader, and then you also have the compressed version by having the compression on the track that you're sending your guitars via sends blended into the master bus or master fader as well. So hopefully that makes sense. When I use Reaper, if I want to use parallel compression, I'll use sends. If I just want to create a simple submix, generally I'll use folders or folder tracks. 
Now, I'd highly recommend downloading my five-step guide to better heavy mixes, where I share with you my simple approach to just mixing heavy music in general. And this includes track layout and routing, and even how I approach EQ and compression. A lot of times these concepts seem overly complex, but they're really, really simple. And we're pretty much just mimicking what's happening in the analog world. The PDF is completely free and there's a link below in this video's description where you can download it and it's all yours. So Mike, excellent question. I'm glad you brought this topic up. I'm gonna be doing more videos on this topic when it comes to just routing and basic track management within DAWs. So let me know if this works out for you and keep me posted on your progress. So I'd just like to shout out and thank everyone for submitting this excellent group of questions. And if you sent me a question and I haven't gotten to it yet, just be patient. I will definitely get to it within one of these videos in this series. If you found this video helpful, like, comment, subscribe, and share. And do not forget to click the little bell icon so you can be notified every time I upload one of our weekly videos on all things metal and rock production. If you're interested in some Fright Box swag, we've got t-shirts, mugs, and a ton of other cool stuff on the way. There's a link below to the Fright Box merch store in this video's description. And again, if you're looking to improve your mixes with the gear that you already have and you want to learn pro techniques that work in the real world, you can download my five-step guide to better heavy mixes. There's a link below in this video's description. Just click it and the PDF is all yours for absolutely free. And until next time, happy mixing.